You're listening to A Book With Legs, a podcast presented by Smead Capital Management. At Smead Capital Management, we advise investors who fear stock market failure. You can learn more at SmeadCap.com or by calling your financial advisor. Welcome to A Book With Legs podcast. I'm Cole Smead. I'm the president and a portfolio manager here at Smead Capital Management. At our firm, we are readers and book junkies. It can be said that leaders are readers, and we believe books provide us a great source of information for filtering what is and isn't important for us as investors. Investing is the last great liberal art and the best way to spend a lifetime of learning. This podcast is for readers, thinkers, business-minded people, and investors who want to grow their knowledge from great authors and their writing. Charlie Munger often talks about using multiple mental models and analysis. Our aim for this podcast is to help listeners test Munger's theory in business, markets, and people. Joining me today to host the episode is our Chief Investment Officer, of who I consider myself a progeny of, Bill Smead. Thanks for doing this with me, Dad. You're welcome. Uh, I'm glad everyone has joined us for this podcast episode. We're going to learn about the genesis of one of the most successful money management firms the world has ever seen. We will also think about questions tied to people, markets, team building, and succession planning in business. Joining us today is Mary Childs to talk about her recently published book, The Bond King, How One Man Made a Market, Built an Empire, and Lost It All. Mary Childs is a, a co-host and a correspondent for NPR's Planet Money podcast. Prior to this role, she was a senior reporter at Barron's Magazine. She has also been a journalist for the Financial Times and Bloomberg News. Mary was a Watson Fellow and is a graduate of Washington and Lee University with a degree in business journalism. Um, let's see, before we get to Mary, Bill, I just wanted to ask you, is there anything uh, after you read the book that you're looking forward to talking about with Mary? It, it's a treasure trove, so I'd have a hard time pinpointing which one. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Mary, thank you for joining us today. Uh, uh, we really appreciate it. Yeah, this is great. Um, so to start off, what, I, you know, I, I can kind of assume this from your writing, but what, what inspired you to put this all together into the book? Oh my gosh, I'm so interested to hear your theory. Um, my my basic thing is that I I started out as a credit reporter at Bloomberg News, and you know in that job, I came across Pimco many times, obviously as one must. And I was kind of like, where is the book on Pimco? You know, there was a Tim Middleton book about Bill Gross that had kind of it was um, kind of many many years in the past at that point, and I just was like, this this company's so massively influential. Um, and, and there's just kind of this dearth of information about them. And that seemed confusing to me, like kind of weird. And then I also had this um, belief that credit is poorly understood in the mainstream world and the kind of greater world, especially relative to how important it is. And so I just kind of got on this little um, tangent in, <laughs> and, and needed to write a book that communicated the importance and relevance and, you know, mechanics of the bond market. But through this, you know, kind of bananas narrative of of the rise of Bill Gross and Pimco, and then the um, implosion is strong, but you know, the twenty fourteen of it all. Uh, you really kind of broke my heart, just so you're aware, when you said that stocks weren't nearly as you know, so interesting as bonds. <laughs> I've gotten that a lot. I'm so sorry. It's a strongly held opinion. I can barely back it up, though. I, I get it. I get it. Trust me. So let's see. Um, so Bill Gro Bill Gross comes off as a very you know tough cookie in general in your writing um, Muhammad in comparison uh, he, he feels very you know friendly and and you know how did that play out when you went to go get sourcing your interviews and information for this story um, well framed. So Bill ended up being, you know, Bill is very mediagenic. He loves to talk to the press and he has for a very long time. He's not the kind of person who like cultivates relationships in the press. He's not like a source, you know, but he's like the person that you can call all the time and get a quote. At, you know, he's not like immensely accessible, but he's he's like a big name that you would be able to get a, a quote from for a story. And that was on purpose because he wanted to be in the press. And, mm -hmm. you know, Mohammed Alarian was also this kind of big, bold face name in the press. But when I started working on this book bill was like oh yeah like i'll be happy to talk you know on and off he was happy to talk to me it was i think dependent on you know how his fund was doing or how he felt about talking to me how he felt on that given day but you know we had many many days where we sat down and he just like told me about his life for hours and his approach and what shaped his investment outlooks and what shaped his you know everything 
And on the flip side, Muhammad Alarian, who is this like incredibly diplomatic, friendly person and, and, you know, extremely available, extremely on Twitter, extremely just everywhere all the time, he wouldn't talk to me. He refused <laughs> to engage with me for seven years. And the only time that he did engage with me began in December 2021. Um, a representative reached out and they, his lawyer actually sent over a very detailed letter. They had evidently obtained a copy of my manuscript, which is, I don't know how no one, you know, from our camp would have, would have shared it. Mm -hmm. Um, and they had notes, which was great because we got to incorporate the notes. We had to literally stop the presses to incorporate them. Mm -hmm. untypeset the book, retypeset the book with their changes, um, which I was happy to do because, you know, I'd spent so long trying to synthetically replicate Muhammad Alarian's state of mind and perspective and to have this kind of, to have him actually get to weigh in when, you know, when he hadn't participated for so long was great. You know, I'm, I'm so glad that that, you know, and, and given how much work I put in, it was kind of gratifying that he like didn't have more notes, <laughs> but sure. Yeah, it was a bit opposite. People, when I talked to people, they assumed that Bill Gross was about to sue me um, and be so mad at me and that Muhammad Alarian was helping me a lot. And I was like, well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Different. So, but, and, and, and in thinking about the difference between those two characters, um, totally randomly, this is probably four or five years ago, I was up at Whistler going skiing with my family and I ran into Muhammad in the village mm. at Whistler. Oh, and wow. And to, to your point, in person, you know, said hello, was very warm, just incredibly nice, you know, face to face. Um, and then I followed up with him on LinkedIn to say, hey, it was great to meet you. I just ghosted. So no I, way. I, I, maybe maybe it's me. But to your point, um, you know, there's just there's very distinctly different personalities here and how they reacted to situations are are, are very different than each other. Quite. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's actually so, amazing that he ghosted you. I'm so sorry. Yeah, uh, it's OK. It's probably <laughs> it might just be more so me, Mary. By the way, Mary, I love what you said about that. Uh, uh, you know, God opens the doors you want open and closes the doors you want closed. And that, that it was a blessing the way that that those notes came to you. Since, <laughs> it was. Since, since Bill Gross, since Bill Gross is the main character of the story, teach our listeners about his background and his upbringing. Yeah, so he grew up in Ohio. Um, he had, you know, his dad worked for a steel company. His mom, Shirley, she was kind of tough on them, um, on the kids growing up. And, and he kind of thinks that they weren't the warm and fuzziest. And he thinks that that kind of instilled in him this this unending quest for reassurance and love. Um, and I think he thinks that this was like the engine that propelled him forward in a lot of ways to these extraordinary, you know, he wanted to be great as a result. Um, but yeah, so he, they ended up moving to California when he was, um, I think still, he was still young. And from there he went to Duke. He was a psych major at Duke and um, he got in a really bad car accident when he was a senior and ended up in the hospital for months. And this is consequential because, I mean, it was very scary and I think bad at the, at the time, but also because he was kind of trapped in this hospital bed, he read a book by Ed Thorpe called Beat the Dealer and learned how to count cards in blackjack. And he was like, well, this can't possibly work. And then he practiced a billion hands and it worked. And he was like, huh, well, okay. So he took $200 to go to Las Vegas and count cards for three months. And this ended up being this foundational legend. He turned that 200 into $10,000 and went to Vietnam uh, in the Navy, came back, put himself through business school with some help from his wife, and then began a job at Pacific Mutual. And the rest is history. You, you know, Warren Buffett started out uh, at the at the horse race track, picking up tickets off the floor and trying to find winning tickets that people had thrown away. And then he started a tout sheet and sold that to people. And it, uh, in in my personal case in this business, my my first uh, stock picking was handicapping greyhounds in Gresham, Oregon. Incredible. So incredible. Uh, so so Bill graduates from Duke, and uh, tell us about what got. Pacific Investment Management Company going? So when he joined Pacific Mutual, it was this, you know, buttoned up insurance company, pretty conservative. And his job was to be a credit analyst to analyze, you know, companies to see if 
Pacific Mutual wanted to lend to them. And his part of that job was, you know, literally clipping coupons off those bond certificates in the basement, sending them in for interest payments, because that's like what you did at the time. And around that time, you know, inflation's really high. So those bonds are basically being eroded in value as they sit in the vaults. And this guy, Howard Rakoff, comes along. And he'd heard from various people, like in his grad school program, that, you know, there was this exciting new thing that you could you could trade bonds. Maybe you could trade bonds. And he needed people to trade with. So he was out evangelizing to people about this new idea. And maybe, you know, are you interested? Can you Will you trade with me? And he pitched to Bill Gross's boss, who was kind of like, eh, I don't know, man, but why don't you try my, you know, my, my kind of junior guys meets Bill Gross. And, you know, from there they launched this friendship, but also this trading relationship that really lasts their lifetimes, their careers. And it ends up, you know, they, Bill Gross has, has this, you know, inspiration and realizes that this is kind of an enormous opportunity, right? Howard Rakoff has pitched him, but he sees it. He totally gets the vision. So he goes back to his boss and he's like, I know you were kind of skeptical, but I mean, listen, just give me a couple dollars, give me, you know, 5 million. And I'll just play with it and see what I can do. And like, we'll figure it out. And the boss is like, meh, okay, great. Let's try it. Which is a little remarkable, right? Like this is an insurance company. It was extremely conservative again. Like this yeah. is not necessarily the way that it always would have gone. But um, but that was the that was the very beginning. You know, they gave them this corporate shell that had been kind of sitting around that actually was PIMCO Equity at first. It was, uh, sorry, Pacific Equity instead of Pacific Income, um, where you know, previous a couple of years, um, McKinsey had recommended that they think more about that they, the the Pacific Mutual, you know, parent company had recommended that they think about doing asset management. And they were like, all right, like maybe. So they had created this random shell and didn't really do anything with it. And so then when, you know, they were going to give these young bucks five million to play with, they were like, here, have this little shell. Like, why don't you do it here? And then they took off. So early on in the book, you you open uh, the storytelling of uh, Pimco uh, in 06, um, and you teach uh, your readers a very peculiar thing that Pimco was up to. So the question is, why were bond guys out meeting with realtors and mortgage brokers in 2006? So multiple reasons, I guess. Um, one being, you know, the cosmetic reason, the 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 kind of public facing reason was Pimco sensed that there was kind of too much froth in the mortgage market, that home prices were too high, that there was maybe shenanigans, that, you know, there there was just going to be a point at which people weren't going to be able to pay their mortgages, that things had gotten too hot. And, you know, as part of that, Bill Gross sent out the mortgage team across the country and they were to visit various neighborhoods that were frothy and report back. And the initial idea, you know, it sounded the, the the thing that got said in the public arena ended up being that, oh, they had posed as interested home buyers, that these mortgage guys who sit at their desks, you know, trading mortgage backed bonds had to go out with brokers with, you know, real estate brokers, drive around and pretend that they wanted to buy a house. And that was the legend. Mm -hmm. Right. This was like a hugely successful story for PIMCO that people were like, oh, my God, did they really do that? And they kind of didn't really do that. They kind of were they didn't actually misrepresent um you know it, it sounds like they actually were kind of uncomfortable with that idea and didn't see any utility to it like why would they mm -hmm. need to do that they could just go and hang out with the mortgage brokers not the real estate brokers and talk about markets in kind of the same way and get a better look into the you know what percentage is adjustable rate here versus you know i mean there's there's a kind of a difference of information flow that you're getting from a real estate broker versus a mortgage broker and arguably the mortgage broker's information is more relevant so it ended up being that, you know, I think they were a little bit annoyed to do this project. It was called the housing project. Um, a little bit like we already know these things. Why do we have to fly around the country and like kind of waste a little bit of time um, driving around needlessly when we already can see this information from our desks? But mm -hmm. I think they would also concede that they did get access. You know, these relationships did end up, did end up being fruitful. They got, you know, an information flow from this random guy over here or access to just just kind of would have these like monthly checkups with all these brokers that they'd met and, and kept up those relationships. So, you know, they were getting that granular on the ground look doing basically shoe leather reporting um, to sure. see what the mortgage market actually looked like. So PIMCO was sitting there at the time uh, taking a lot less risk than the market was. Um, and they were underperforming and, and you kind of lay out that this was a, you know, this was a, 
relatively speaking, a kind of a big underperformance while other people are taking risk. Why would Bill Gross want to sit there and choose to underperform? I think it's a really interesting concept for what, you know, why would a money manager choose to underperform? Yeah. Yeah. It's funny to put it that way because it was a choice, right? Everyone else was still, you know, happily partying away in the years leading up to the financial crisis, buying incredibly risky debt as it came to market, enjoying the, you know, nice yields that come with that and not really preparing for the worst. And PIMCO, because they had this sense, this idea that the mortgage market was was too hot and going to turn at some point, you know, you can't time that. I mean, you can try and like maybe you'll luck out, but it's super risky to try to time that. And that's not really the PIMCO approach. Um, mm -hmm. So they instead, as you say, they ramped down risk and they just kind of sat on their hands and waited. And I think it was very painful. I think, you know, knowing that something's about to happen is kind of a curse, you know? You have to do something until it happens. And so they're just like doing low risk things or lower risk and watching their competitors beat them by doing things that they were like, that's reckless, but no one knows it yet. You're Amen. taking too much risk. You're about to jump into this like fire pit, but no one knows it yet. I'm right. You're gonna know I'm right, but no one knows it yet. Good preaching. Yeah, we, we, we've, uh, we felt out the last couple of years. So we, I mean, we understand it, but I just say that because I think your book does a great job of explaining they chose to underperform. So let's let's pivot because um, there's something interesting and kind of timely for now. Um, Mark Keisel, who's obviously at PIMCO today, um, is telling people right now that housing's topped out and he's selling his personal res residence in Orange County, much like he did in the me me you know the mid 2000s. Um, yeah. And at the same time, there's other parts of PIMCO that if you go out there and Google and look, they're painting a, a, a not as dour of a picture. So I guess mm -hmm. after you know doing all this research on that the, the kind of the housing debacle, how PIMCO benefited, and what sits today, like how do you look at that? You know, then versus today's situation. Oh, that's so hard. I mean, I think uh, as a journalist, it's hard too because like la the last time, like very much twenty twenty vision, like looking back and being like, "Wow, Mark Cusel nailed it!" Like that was totally right. I will say that the knock on that call was that he was getting a divorce and selling his house as a result of that divorce, and not mm -hmm. so much as a market call. Um, sure. Although he he does get full credit, he you know put it forward as such, and he was obviously famously correct. Um, sure. But I think that, you know, there are other places that are saying, oh, invest in real estate, invest in hard assets because of the inflation paradigm. So sure. I don't know. Take that as you will, I guess. Well, I just like that you point out that he's he's not perfect. He's fallible. So let's pivot. Um, Aren't um, we all? Yeah, uh, let's let's pivot. Uh, so, uh, you know, the investors early on that PIMCO worked with, you kind of teach a little bit about the client type. Um, what, what, who were there early, you know, outside investors that, that, that came to PIMCO? So a lot of the very early conversations when it was not a proven thing, I think relied on the good graces and relationships of, of some of the folks at, at Pacific Mutual where they would be like, Hey, you know, we're trying this thing. Do you want to, do you want to give it a go? And mm -hmm. they had some, you know, very illustrious people that were well-respected in the industry. So I think that, um, they would say too, that that helped, that, that helped to get them in the door at a lot of these places. AT&T was the big break when they managed to get, um, a, an account with AT&T. That was the moment when they were really able to say, okay, we've made it. Um, you know, and other people were like, Oh, AT&T. Oh, okay. You know, that was very much a, a a stamp of approval. And I think that's true. You know, I talked to the pension manager at um, RJ Reynolds and he was saying that, you know, they were kind of these like young guys. They were clearly ambitious and clearly very smart. But then there was also this kind of babysitter effect where the Pacific Mutual over, you know, that the parent company was still kind of keeping them in check in a way. Like you had this sense that they were aggressive, ambitious young bucks, but there's also this over, you know, overseeing, you know, they, they actually have someone over their shoulder, which I think was reassuring too. So um, that pension manager also indeed started to um, invest money with them. And I think at the time they were actually among the lowest fees. Um, you know, I think that uh, that's not part of the legend really, but that was, you know, I looked at the, um, the, re the research that a consultant did and they were like the second lowest of the bucket of fixed income managers that they'd put forward. Um, so yeah, and they really, they tried to target large, uh, pension accounts and, and retirement accounts to try to get that scale to help them grow more quickly. Um, they were always kind of institutionally focused, but also aiming for people for, for accounts that would allow them to take risk that were interested okay. in letting them do fun stuff, you know? Sure. 
Um, we just crossed the 35th anniversary of PIMCO Total Return, uh, which was launched in May of 87, um, as of, you know, about a week ago. Uh, I love that you know that. That's amazing. That <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I got I got to do my homework um, if I'm going to have you on. So, so um, how big was the mutual fund business compared to that pension business um, in your research? They really didn't focus on the mutual fund side of it for a long time. I think this was actually kind of a point of confusion for me because there was such a wave of growth in the 80s that I think they did have that growth, but on a relative basis, they didn't capitalize on it or focus on it like their peers did. So they were like mm -hmm. relatively left behind, but still accrued. You know what I mean? Like it wasn't their like big, big thing. They did. They were still focusing on these larger accounts um, sure. and, and mutual fund. That mutual fund focus came later is my sense. Yeah, there, there was an explosion. I, obviously, I was in the industry in the yeah. 80s, and there, there was an explosion among the stock brokerage community that, hey, maybe we'd be a lot better off to farm the money out to uh, uh, somebody that's an expert and, and then mm -hmm. just go raise money. Uh, uh, you, you know, you point out that he put together good returns in the late 70s and early 80s, mm -hmm. uh, including in the recessions of 81 and 83. To quote your work, quote, that's what earns gross acclaim in the 1980s on Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser, the Friday night PBS show that minted the industry cele celebrities. Uh, te teach your read readers about how, how important it was for Bill to be famous and how much he kind of craved that kind of attention. Yeah, he said that this was, you know, the desire to be famous was his motivating factor, was the thing that, you know, made him, drove him to be great. And in some ways, the bond market was just the vehicle for that. Um, he had this, he attributes it to those, you know, those cold Canadian parents that he talked about where he just didn't feel like they were warm and fuzzy and didn't hug. And thus he, you know, again, he was kind of searching to fill that void um, by being famous, by being on TV, by getting all these headlines and getting kind of a public adoration in lieu of that, I don't know, childhood um, affection. So. I do think, you know, this this was his big break is, is I think how he would describe it. You know, the, the booker for uh, Wall Street Week was kind of like, I need a Bond guy. And somebody was like, oh, you know, Bill Gross. And he was like, OK, called Bill Gross and Bill became the Bond guy. And, you know, in some sense, this is like a normal TV booking process where you're like, who's the guy? Who's the like up and coming person? And and this was the right answer. But it is very funny because it's both like self-fulfilling. And it, it was like the right booking, but it also made him, you know, it made his career and made him be the bond market guy. And that was very that endured. That was a persistent thing. And and that was indeed, like you say, like that was what he wanted. He wanted to to be the face of the bond market. It, it's it's hard to visualize now when we're inundated with so many resources and so much media so associated with the industry. But, you know, I started my career and literally Friday, I, I'd get home, I'd be exhausted, we'd cook dinner and, and, and then we'd, we'd wait till 8.30 to watch on the Pacific Coast Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser. And, and of course, of course, John Templeton and Peter Lynch were the most favored guests o over the decades, but certainly uh, I remember Bill Gross quite well. And, and that, that was something you looked at. Uh, uh, and, and you did a great job, I think, of, of, of explaining so there were some interesting and somewhat disturbing uh, cultural traits to PIMCO. Uh, you said that Ben, ben Trotsky, Trotsky, who built the high yield business at PIMCO, would ask interviewees two questions. Were you abused as a child and did you like it? Teach our listeners about why someone at PIMCO would ask bizarre questions like this. Yeah. I mean, it's funny because so I describe in the book this intense culture, this like kind of bullying on the trade floor. Um, there are all these stories that randomly seem to center around this one person and people swore to me that he was not always the brunt of the bullying and they wouldn't call it bullying. Um, but it just is weird that all the stories were about him. You know, um, they cut his tie off because it was an ugly tie. They doused him with bug spray. They would like tackle him and touch football before he was ready and like had said the thing that allows you to talk. <laughs> I don't know football. Um, so, you know, the, they had this. Uh, feeling that it was a like twisted little family that they were it was a very small crew in the 90s and they were very hard on each other and I think you know Bill's not harder on other people than he is on himself but he's so incredibly hard on himself so that you know and he's intense and focused and he'll kind of hiss at you like he's not gonna yell at you but he's gonna talk and you know angry tiny words at you um, and and I think like in his mind I'm, I'm projecting a little bit because he hasn't told me this but I think that he has a sense that anything done in the service of client, 
you know, of performance is okay. And like, that's why I'm being hard on you. We need the best ideas. And if you want to bring me bad ideas, I'm going to be hard on you because they need to be better. Like, I just need you to be better than you're being. And like, that's forgivable. I just like, we're pressing each other to like do better. And I think that um, some people were like, yeah, no, exactly. I want that. Like, make me better. Like, this is this is the way. And other people are like, oh, my God, get me out of here. This is abuse. So um, difference of opinion. I've definitely I got a letter, like an email the other week after the book came out where someone had read the book and he had been at Pimco and he was like, I think it was totally accurate. But like, you know, I would take issue with your characterization that it was bullying. You know, we were hard on each other, but it was all out of love and we really got along and it was great, blah, blah, blah. And then like the email goes on and at the end of some paragraph, he's like, yeah, we had a lot of people come in from like the banks and we chewed them up and spat them out. And I'm like, I think we're, I think we're saying the same thing, man. Like, I think, <laughs> I think we disagree on some of the <laughs> adjectives yeah. we would use, but uh, sure. yeah, I think it's the same. T teach our audience about Bill Thompson's arrival at the firm and, and cover the hazing stunt that he won the won the troops over with. Yeah, so Bill Thompson is a very astute observer, and uh, he came in from Solomon Brothers, which is a pretty good proxy for the PIMCO culture. Um, and I think, you know, that was intentional at the time uh, to some degree. And he comes in and he's like looking around and he's like, these guys are all so self-serious and they don't take me seriously. They think I'm some like bureaucrat. That's like this big thing within PIMCO. If you're not touching the money, if you're not trading, like what are you doing here? And so Bill Thompson like intuits this, he picks this up. I mean, at one point, one of the guys threw a chair at him. So maybe it wasn't intuitive. Maybe it was pretty explicit, but he <laughs> is like, okay, I got to do something about this. And he convenes a meeting, a dinner, you know, a little bit of an offsite where all the partners will gather. And, you know, at first it's like a normal dinner. We're all like, you know, happily eating our little steaks and drinking wine. And he gets up and he has all these headshots basically these pictures of all of the managing directors and he pins them to the wall and he's like okay we're gonna say what we really think of each other go ahead call him an asshole <laughs> and and everyone in the audience is like um what like what? we're just like having a normal this is like a normal night i'm trying to be normal with my colleagues who i'm gonna see on the trade floor like Ugh. and so they're like um ass asshole uh, he's an asshole and then you know over time it starts being like oh no okay and then they like they get it out and they're like yelling at each other like asshole and like really relishing the opportunity to yell what they really think of each other at each other you know you're sitting next to the guy you're not turning to look at him and call him an asshole you're looking at the picture in the front of the room so it's okay yeah. it's different very cathartic everyone loved it wow uh, yeah. could, could could you ever see something like that today I mean, maybe not as, I mean, as well as like equal opportunity, I guess, in a nice way, you know, um, I well, don't It's not know gender that specific it either. It's not That's gender specific. Part. It's yeah. not racist. What a relief, you know, exactly. thank God. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's anatomical. Yeah. yeah about, it's yeah. just simple. It's very Tra simple. Yeah. Talk, talk a little bit about the grow or die culture at PIMCO. Yeah. Do you believe it worked in the early years and, and then became in some respects, uh, a problem later on? Yeah. I think that's probably right. Um, and this isn't unique necessarily to PIMCO, but there was an idea that they had to keep growing or they would die. There's this, you know, I think this this stems a bit from the early days where the Pacific Mutual babysitters would come in and be like, you got to make this thing make sense or we're going to shut it down, you know, and they did that for years. And that instills a bit of a, you know, intense entrepreneurial sense in you that, that the, the edge of the cliff is always nearby. And I think that persisted. And, and it also, you know, Pimco Bill's an intense and focused person, as I've said, and, and, you know, very much paranoid about the competition catching up with him. So I think, you know, naturally he kind of always had that looking over his shoulder sensibility. Um, but they very much were always pushing to grow, always pushing to find a new frontier and this is kind of a foundational thing to the, com the the massive companies that we know today that are, you know, normal household names today. Um, mm -hmm. That's it's also, you know, I don't know if you've seen the Uber um, super pumped show. It's like the first episode is called Grow or Die. And I was like, oh, hey, me too. I got that too. Um, but I think that's that's instructive because there is a middle a middle ground, right? Like there's grow persist or die like you can also just kind of grow slowly you don't have to sure. you know keep killing it every single minute and i think that's that you know i'm saying that but like no one would agree with me <laughs> in our business we think about seasons right so to your point there was a grow or die season early on in pimco 
but every season brings different issues and struggles. And, and I think your book does a great job of talking about what that was like with people in each season, right? When people passed the baton, what was the next season? But to your point, the cultural tone was, no, we want to keep it the same. And that was impossible. Um, yeah, pedal on to that, the metal, on yeah. That, exactly. And on that note, so, um, you know, Muhammad El Aryan has this run at PIMCO. He leaves in 06. Um, uh, teach our listeners what he did at, at Harvard and then why they wanted to bring him back. Yeah, so his uh, thing at Harvard was really focusing on alts, was bringing in, you know, had a very, like, diversified portfolio. And I think that there's there's a lot of controversy over his tenure at Harvard, and there's kind of a lot of controversy over anyone's tenure at Harvard, um, mm -hmm. running Harvard Management Co., the, the um, endowment there. But, you know, it did it famously did very badly in the crisis, um, which is kind of a thread that I just, like, didn't do in the book. Um, but there is, like, you know, PIMCO thought that that looked good that diversification thing you know the push into private equity and hedge funds and alts and like all these different structures and real estate and, and and bringing on these different types of risk because i mean rightly there was a sense that pimco had too many kind of eggs in one basket it was such a bond shop and they kept trying to do equities you know they tried two or three times before muhammad came back and it was just like it just never really stuck um and they were like well but we should do other stuff stuff right like we can't just be 100 percent a bond shop they have the stocks plus option which is kind of a synthetic exposure to stocks so it wasn't 100 percent, but it was just like surely we should do other things and that i think was part of the idea in bringing muhammad alarian back you know he was supposed to come in as bill gross's heir apparent as the successor mm -hmm. um so in that cio role but at the last minute you know they ended up making him also co-ceo with bill thompson and that makes some sense if your if your job is to help push into you know diversified whatever like maybe that is more of an executive or kind of managerial side of like business choice side of things than investing necessarily but i think this was like not quite the path that they had intended for themselves um right. and and that ended up being um big problematic <laughs> when it's so ironic because i mean you you know as you, your readers are going through your book they're like here's bill thompson and bill gross sitting down with him to plead to bring him in and within a few chapters, you have Bill Gross, I mean, l losing it. So, I mean, the irony there is so rich. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is. And I think like that meeting that you reference where they're they're pitching Muhammad al on, you know, what do you think about coming back to PIMCO and in this role? It is really a sad moment because I feel like it's right before everything is cursed. You know, like it's it's before mm -hmm. the relationship. Yeah. I mean, there's a world in which they could have functioned. Right. I think they had the deck a bit stacked against them by virtue of their personalities, like Bill being such an investor and Muhammad being such an economist is kind of how I think of it. And so, like, arguably, they never would have thrived just because of who they are as people and managers and traders or like, you know, investors. But, you know, when that, you know, PIMCO had always kind of prided itself and pitched itself as this three legged stool. You know, we keep business, client and investing separate. That's a different function. Those are different people. Everybody stays in their lane. And Muhammad Alarian came in straddling two of those. And a two legged stool is not a it's not a, it falls over. So so I think, you know, they'll tell you that was the first and last time they're ever going to do that. And mm -hmm. it was sort of I think the even if Bill and Muhammad could have gotten along as people and managers and investors, like risk, if they could have been aligned on those things, this structural problem, the two-legged stool problem, I think would have would have still doomed them, you know? B B Buffett and Munger like to say that if you have an economist on staff, you have one too many employees. And, and I think that's what they ran into there. Uh, so so uh, little pivot, Bill Gross loves small, but structural advantages, uh, uh, you know, ex explain Lambda Cash as one of these structural advantages. Teach our audience what Lambda Cash was. Yeah, so Lambda Cash is basically the idea of exploiting the difference in time in a futures contract, for example. If you buy a contract today, but the contract, you know, you, you don't have to actually use all of the money to, to buy the, you know, underlying security or whatever it is at the end of the contract, you know, there's a, there's a day, two months in the future where, where you will need that money. In the meantime, you can invest that money. You know, you have, you have to like spend this much to buy the contract. You have to collateralize against it maybe. But in the meantime, you have all this money left over because you're not spending as much to buy the underlying thing. You're getting the same exposure for less. So the idea is that, you know, by buying the synthetic, the derivative version, 
you've freed up all this money to go do whatever you want with it. That's Lambda Cash. And there's this idea too of like, you know, of leaning into the difference between cash and cash equivalents, where you're supposed to collateralize with cash and cash equivalents. This is to say, you know, should something go wrong and you need to put up money, you know, more money against this, or you need to hand over your cash, it's there. You have it to hand over. And PIMCO could say in good faith, like, yes, I have your cash and cash equivalents. Because over here in this bucket, instead of just sitting on cash that doesn't yield me much, I am holding short dated Campbell soup notes or, you know, German, whatever. Like I'm holding securities that yield me. German is a bad example because that would not yield you anymore. But the, the, the kind of idea of being you can find things that are basically as good as cash, but that yield you a little bit more, you know, a short dated corporate note. It's probably going to be fine. It's probably going to turn, you know, you'll have a little bit of notice if they're, if Campbell's soup is going to go bankrupt, right? Like that's that probably you would get a heads up. So why not just lean a little bit harder in the cash equivalent direction, get a little bit more, more reward for it and just do that all day, every day, overnight, all the time and reap the extra basis points, which like might not sound like a lot, but over time and because you're doing in such scale, you're going to end up with, you know, percentage point differences over time. Yeah, they they did this later in a fund called Stock Plus, and the irony is uh, yeah. we had a pretty we had a pretty good stretch of performance from 11 through 15, and our only real significant competitor in returns was this Pimco oh, Stock wow. Plus fund. Uh, yeah. uh, you, you know, we we bumped heads with that thing uh and uh it's a good product, yeah. I guess, you know. Yeah, when it works. Yeah. I don't so know. Can you teach our, our listeners what Stock Plus was in comparison to, you know, what you said in terms of using futures for bonds? What was Stock Plus was in comparison? You basically just get the S&P exposure and then invest the the leftover cash in in short dated bonds. So it's the same like here's the big bucket, you know, I'm getting the the big notional exposure, I'm getting my stock exposure and just doing kind of an index thing, and then mm -hmm. I have this little side bucket of my you know where I'm, I'm investing in short dated bonds and notes to get a little bit extra juice and that's sure. the basic idea is pairing those two things and this is actually kind of a myron shoals thing this is like derived from he was like why don't you make this a product um so they they actually i think he was on on the board um many decades ago and, and was like hey you have a good idea here just do this so so uh later on uh they took they took total return into an etf Teach our listeners the loophole they used to gain a performance advantage in the ETF space. The best. So they wanted the ETF to do well because, as we all know, the initial track record for a product matters a lot and will for a long time. And so what they did was, um, you know, in the mortgage back market, there are, you know, it's, it's a pool of, of securities. And over time, it kind of decays because people pay off their mortgage, they get a new house, they pay off the old loan. You know the, the which means the the pool kind of gets like lopsided and wonky as like this this side of it got paid down and that side defaulted and it's just like it gets misshapen into what is called an odd lot and a lot of people don't really see the value in investing in odd lots because they are a bit more trouble um but the nice thing is they traded a discount so pimco does generally like odd lots more but then they also w had this thing where if you plopped an odd lot mortgage backed bond into the pricing system, it would round it up to the whole lot price. So it didn't really have a, a way to recognize the discount that these things trade at because it's just like didn't it's a pricing mechanism. It doesn't it doesn't know. So PIMCO realized this and you know it seems to have become this overt strategy where they were like, okay, we can't 17A7 as much as we want, which is the kind of 40 act loophole that allowed them to like drop bonds in from other funds and couldn't do as many derivatives as we normally like. So here's the thing we're going to do. We're going to dig up all these different odd lots and drop them in. And there you go. Um, and the, the effect of this was that the ETF like outperformed the mutual fund version of the exact same fund to the extent that people were like, wait, what even is going on here? What, mm -hmm. this is a significant outperformance. I mean, we wrote about it at Bloomberg. People wrote about it. At, it was just a, it ended up being a pretty big disparity, maybe more than they had intended. And it kicked up questions. And then that ended up actually, um, it became the focus of an SEC investigation and eventual settlement. So it was, uh, it was clever, but maybe a bit too clever. Uh, people had a hard time getting a job after leaving PIMCO because of how terribly they treated brokers on the street. 
why, what, tell us, explain this contradiction between this um, amazing distaste for the firm, but yet the brokers all wanted part of the action, the business. Absolutely. So because PIMCO is so enormous in the market and kind of always was, you know, th when they were small, the market was smaller. Um, it's this idea that, you know, and Bill Gross said this before it really made sense, but that you're going to want to know what PIMCO is doing. You as the street mm -hmm. need to know what we're doing because our flow is going to matter so much to you, is going to matter so much to the market that that's going to be what's valuable, not the trades. You're not going to make money on the trades with us. You're going to make money basically by knowing what we're doing and where we're going. And again, this was like, you know, he said this in the 80s to a young, uh, you know, guy at Morgan Stanley who was like, wait, what? Like, I, I don't, I don't, oh, sorry, excuse me, it was Merrill, sorry. But the the idea became, and that became true. They could treat people worse. They could treat their sales coverage <laughs> at banks worse because the sales coverage needed them. Because they were mm -hmm. so enormous and so influential in the market, there was like, like what are you going to not call PIMCO when you have a new bond issue coming? Like you need PIMCO. There's no, like you need the biggest buyer in your market to be on board with your, you know, with your new issues to make sure that they go well. You need them to be on board and to be, you know, interacting with you nicely and, and buying the bonds like in secondary markets all the time. So it did end up working, but you're right. The derivative effect of this was if I am the trader at PIMCO and I have Bill Gross over my shoulder telling me to get better execution that I'm failing the clients and failing my job and fail, you know, by not getting better, you know, by not pressing more basis points out of the street. That means I'm going somewhat knowing I'm on this like suicide mission, but saying, you know, you need to give me better execution and being so hard on them and so terrible to them to get it. So then when you want to get a new job and you apply elsewhere and you're like, Hey, I've been at PIMCO this many years, you know, they call your wall street sales coverage as a reference. And they're like, Hey, what do you think of this guy? He's applying for a job. And the Wall Street sales coverage is like, oh my God, I hate him. That guy's the worst. <laughs> and I think this is also like when you're carrying out a mission like that and you know it's doomed, like there's something corrosive about that. That's just depressing. So I think on all fronts, like, you know, you feel bad about it, but you're still treating people badly and then the people don't like you. And then it's just kind of this spiral effect. So yeah, it ended up turning it. It was kind of effective for PIMCO too, because that meant that there was like no bid for their employees elsewhere. So sure. these people are, were kind of trapped which meant they could underpay the lower ranking people and they couldn't leave. They were only powerful in as much as they were an agent of PIMCO. It was a moat. Yeah. And I, I remember you talking about where it, Gross would tell the traders if you, if they hit your bid, kind of like you're thinking about, you know, so they put a bid out via Bloomberg. If they hit your bid, you overpaid. In other words, like you need to get on the phone with them and you need to literally balk them down, walk them on their price down till they're, you know, begging you you know, finally. Until it so hurts I, them, right. Correct, exactly. Boy, and, and that's what, what they, they, they so much went after pennies. Yeah. Right, they were, they were picking up pennies in front of a steamroller. So, so PIMCO became very important in the cleanup of 0809. Um, you point out that Bill Gross got a call from Timothy Geithner in late 08. This becomes another theme of your book. How, how cozy was PIMCO with the government during that kind of cleanup period? Yeah, I think, um, you know, PIMCO was at the center of the mortgage market and the mortgage market was the center of the crisis. So it it very much was the case that the U.S. government like had to listen to PIMCO, mm -hmm. um, whether or not they wanted to. Right. And I think they there are a bunch of instances where they hired PIMCO where the U.S. government, some arm of it, hired PIMCO to advise on something or to run a program for them um, because they needed expertise and needed kind of an agent to do some of the work that they needed done. And in the kind of Fannie Freddie of it all, it you know, the the mortgage market was obviously everybody was underwater on their mortgages and couldn't pay. And it was this extremely dire moment. And, you know, Fannie and Freddie were in trouble. And PIMCO, uh, Bill and others at PIMCO put forward the idea that that basically the government needed to articulate the, the how much they were going to back Fannie and Freddie. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as we all know now, Fannie and Freddie were put into conservatorship. And basically everyone right below PIMCO in the capital structure got wiped out. And, you know, that's just kind of perfect for PIMCO. That was sure. wonderful. The day the news came out, that was the best performance for total return on record at the time. So mm -hmm. it was sort of this, I, I don't know that they were like, I don't know if the U.S. government like loved the fact that they were cozy with PIMCO. I don't know that they were like, yay, PIMCO. But necessarily, they had to be cozy with PIMCO. They, the, it was an essential part. You know, the one I quote a guy who was um, in an article at the time saying, 
if PIMCO didn't exist, the government would need to invent them. It they were so crucial and so critical to that cleanup. Sure. Well, and I and I I, I remember like a, there's a part in your in your book where you talk about how PIMCO is sitting there saying, okay, what does the government need to buy next? And we need to get ahead of that. It was like almost like a it's like they're front running the government's trades in a way. Um, and to your point about, I remember the day you talk about conservatorship, Bill and I were in a car on a drive back from uh, Walla Walla in our alma mater. So those, those days are like seared <laughs> into yeah. our minds. So, My, yeah. um, so, so then they hire, they hire Neil Kashkari, which is interesting because they talk about the coziness of the government, you know, here, here is someone who effectively built tarp and it was like a, a invented idea with a couple of people that had not a clue what they were talking about in some respects. Um, but that didn't work. I mean, Kashkari didn't work. Obviously, he's now a you know it's, it's dealing with the Fed. But why didn't why didn't that work? And why was the his coziness at one time with his government role? Why did that not fit at Pimco? Yeah, I think culturally there are a lot of differences where what succeeds in D.C. or in kind of government and quasi government arenas is just not going to work at Pimco. Like there is a, a political element to Pimco and like a presentation, like a polish that they like, but the kind of mechanics of what you do are so different. Like there's not. You're not going to thrive necessarily if you're just politicking and glad handing at PIMCO. Like mm -hmm. no one is going to respect that. So mm -hmm. the, the emptiness of political, I don't know, things that work in D.C. just are never going to thrive at PIMCO. You need to have the P&L basically to back it up. Now, I think some I will put a little asterisk on that because I think some of the discrimination lawsuits would take issue with that and would say it's not actually meritocratic sure. in that way. But sure. um, but but, you know, the 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 brand and what they think of themselves is certainly like you need to present well and you need to like have a really well-trimmed beard and like really nice suit when you're presenting at PIMCO and your presentation needs to have the right numbers and like everything needs to be formatted correctly, which, you know, you can hear that also at an investment bank or elsewhere. So, but there, but the, the, you need the kind of, the kind of credibility to be able to make the presentation in the first place. And Neil, I think didn't, fit at PIMCO for a lot of reasons, kind of the cultural DC, like, you know, he's, he's like polite and nice and like moves through the world with a smile. You know, there's a, a scene in the book where, um, a junior person holds the door for him and like, he speeds up as he walks towards the person holding the door, which is like, Oh, okay. Um, not necessarily the, the norm, you know, it's, it's kind of expected at PIMCO. I'm told to, for the junior person to hold the door for the senior person and like you share the elevator together and no one talks. But mm -hmm. Neil like looks the person in the eyes and says, thank you. And the person's like, oh my God, this guy's doomed. Like he will never make it here. <laughs> and like, which is well, chilling, right? Like that's just. Well, but you, you, make, you make Neil sound so sane. And then he turns around and leaves Pimpko and runs for as a Republican in California. I mean, is, you know, that, there, is that really that funny. sane? <laughs> yes, because I mean, think about how many Republicans are in. There are a lot of Republicans. People think it's so liberal, but like its brand of liberal well, is in, like kind in, of sideways. In Orange ways. County. In Orange County. There's, Orange there's County, quite. quite yeah. Yes. I mean, yeah, you leave. Right. Yes, exactly. So I think like it's it's a joke it's funny but you're completely right but it is also like the the republicanism is understated in california in my view sure. but like yeah i don't think neil was ever set up to succeed at pimco i think it was kind of a um i don't know i think it was not a not a great job um for if you're if you're measuring success by like being able to do what you're supposed to do well so on that thread um lower for longer was the motto okay and that's where they built the brand around you know post 0809 um, uh, but they recognized they needed to pivot to other their uh, other asset classes, other risks like equities. Um, can you teach us a little bit about how they tried to do that? Yeah, so they hired Neil to run an equities push, um, and this was not their first foray into equities. They just kind of hadn't been able to make it stick, aside from the Stocks Plus um, kind of version. And mm -hmm. so, you know, Neil's job was to bring in you know, build new products and hire equity managers. And this was kind of under the, you know, Muhammad al is the CEO at this time, and he's trying to to also, that's his, his mission, is to move beyond, quote, burgers and bonds, uh, which is what Bill called kind of the core business of the mutual fund business, the, the, the bond focus of the business. And so that meant, you know, they had some private equity and some, uh, they had some hedge fund products at the time, but they just weren't, like, very public. They were very much institutional products that, like, not a lot of people were aware of. And so they were going to grow those and do this stocks push, like have stock mutual funds. Mm -hmm. And that did not go well. They just weren't able to raise very much money in that area. And the performance did not help them raise money in that area. It just like wasn't there. 
And, you know, there are like a bunch of reasons for this, but most fundamentally, like one person told me that, you know, they would be railing on the stocks people to uh, get better execution, to negotiate the bid ask. Mm -hmm. And there's no bid ask in stocks. It's a commission. Yeah. You know, so it's just a fundamentally different orientation that I think just they're not speaking the same language. It, it just reminds me that maybe they should have gone into some kind of equity merger arbitrage where you're trying to pick deal up with spreads. Pick, yeah, pick up small spreads. Yeah. That's what they when did it, in cause, stock. Because we, we remember at the time, um, I think it was 2010, PIMCO hired, um, and I can't remember if this was in your book or not, but um, they hired Ann Gudefin and Charles Lahr from Templeton to come in to run. It was like you know, this deep value global team, you know, a product that was selling at Templeton. And to your point, it, it was a thud. Nothing happened out of it. No, no significant capital was raised. And I think you point out a very interesting point, and I wanted to ask you this. Um, you know, both, an area, both Elarian and Gross believed in stocks as the path, you pointed out, but neither believed in stock picking or had any experience doing it. Um, should have, should, shouldn't that have just stopped the conversation there? Like, we have no ability to understand this? Yeah, I mean, other firms do it. So, like, you know, do expand successfully. But I sure. don't know that their like existing DNA is so strong in one area, you know, like it, it may be the case that other firms are more like, I don't know, chill or nimble or able to like, like flexible or malleable. You know, I, I it is weird that the that there's just like no oxygen for stocks at PIMCO. It just it just can't thrive there. And I think you're not wrong that the lack of experience, you know, the thing that they always said was we don't want to hire. We don't want to buy a shop. Because mm -hmm. then you pay for it twice. They're always saying you're, you're paying for it twice. Because, you know, you pay for it up front. And then when, you know, you pay the manager who's sitting there, but they're not trying that hard anymore because they just cashed out. And then by the time their golden handcuffs are, you know, they go away and you have to like rebuild the whole business. Sure. So, which makes sense. But at the same time, it's like, so you're saying you don't want to acquire something that's already working. Like, maybe there was something that was working that you could have learned from. But I don't know if that would have worked because... Well, I was gonna say you you sold me, Mary. We'll never go into bonds. Okay. Well, <laughs> and, and 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 the new the new normal approach that they sold heavily was very anti equity. Uh, uh, but by the way, we 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 worked directly against that. We used that as an inspiration for buying stocks. So uh, gross went to zero treasuries in 2011. Initially, it worked. Then the S and P downgraded treasuries from AAA, and sovereign debt crisis exploded. Gross was on the wrong side of the trade. He was playing for inflation. How unsettling was this to the firm and Gross at the time? I think very unsettling. But the thing, yeah, it was it's a deviation from like the risk management that they say underpins all of their approach, right? It's this enormous call, which is kind of timing the market. And yes, there was a robust rationale for it, or there was kind of, but it is, you know, Colin Roche noted in at the time that, you know, Bill's been calling that at the bond market for decades at, at that point and, you know, still has. And and it was kind of like, wh why this big call now? And this one's hard for me. Like, I don't actually have a good explanation of his mindset because, you know, he talked about it in the press, but he there's no to me, I couldn't parse like why necessarily he saw this as the moment to deviate from like the Kelly criterion of, you know, betting small and leaning in only when the odds are in your favor, his Vegas approach. Like, why didn't we stick with that kind of risk management? Part of why they did so well in the crisis was because they didn't try to time it. You know, they suffered sure. through the years in, in the run up and then they they were wet, you know, they were better prepared to take advantage when when the crisis actually arrived. So it's like, you did such an elegant job of structuring and like risk managing that. Where did this come from? This one, this one puzzles me. I can give a, a different answer for that. That's apropos to right now, which was Bill Gross was trained in college in an inflationary era. And for those young adults that, that went through that 11% inflation, you you're always got your eye looking back and saying, boy, if the circumstances ever come together and remember there was a huge amount of federal government stimulus put in, that would have made him nervous about but, that. But was was this just the begin? Was this the beginning of the end, Mary? I mean, this was the biggest bomb he had had. What wasn't this just kickstarting plausibly the end? I think so. I mean, it definitely served to undermine his credibility internally, well, and externally, where you know you're only as good as your last trade, and if your last mm -hmm. trade was this enormous embarrassment, like you're you're wounded, and Pimco 
everyone at PIMCO is trained to hunt weakness. So, so necessarily you are kind of, you've made yourself vulnerable by having such a big, I don't know, black mark on your record. And I think that that, yes, I think that this is the beginning of the end for Bill. I think he could have recovered at this time. Sure. I think if he had Did continued to deliver and the management stuff had gone well somehow, yes, it, you know, it would have been a very different story. And maybe I wouldn't have written a book because it would have been a boring story. It would have been fine. D didn't the taper tantrum kind of set up a similar uh, circumstance? Absolutely. And I think that's, you know, you see, you know, anytime rates rise, I feel like it, it exposes cracks, right? And the cracks start to widen. It sure. starts to, it, it exposes what we've been doing wrong, but like our, our bad assumptions that, that held, you know, that we didn't know were bad because everything was going our way. You know, a rising market can, can do a lot for people and can mask a lot of problems. When the tide goes out, Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. When, I walked right into that buffet. Naked. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So so you point out a really interesting dichotomy where obviously the taper tantrum hits, Bill Gross is underperforming, and then you have like uh, Avaskin and the income team buying out, you know, commercial mortgages, buying real assets in a way. And, you know, it, it's one thing to underperform. It's another thing to underperform and be a jerk to people that are succeeding. Um, yes. Within uh, your own company. Maybe that's why. Company. Yeah, was this just jealousy pouring out of his underperformance? I think so. I mean, I think, you know, of course. Like, there was a sense within PIMCO that you never wanted to be in the press too much for doing well because it would just put a target on your back. Like, you just didn't sure. want to kind of be individually singled out in any way. Um, Bill Gross didn't seem to like, you know, rising stars or sharing that spotlight that he worked so hard to get for himself. So I think sure. that is definitely part of it. And also like this will come up again. You know, this continues to be a theme where he doesn't really get Iverson's area. He doesn't really get the the world of real estate investment, private equity structures, like all this kind of longer term, you know, not mark to market. That kind of world is different for him and isn't where he grew up, isn't his expertise. Like he knows a lot of things and he's a, a big actor but like i think that kind of risk just wasn't what he was comfortable with and what he felt he could wrap his mind around and this becomes another kind of seed right where you know you start to see this discomfort growing and the firm you know this was now the growth area for the firm like Iverson was ascendant and his products were ascendant so it's like this idea of risk that he can't totally trust he has a, a, a big like trust thing and he would be able to deputize, I think, when he when he trusted the person. But I don't know how much he like knew Dan that well. You know, in the 90s, it was like, OK, he didn't trust high yield that much. He felt like it was kind of like he's getting ripped off, but he trusted Ben Trotsky. So he was like, sure. all right, you do you and I'm comfortable. I'm OK with it. I understand what you're doing. I trust you. You do it. But we're so far from that by 2013 and 14. We're so you know, the firm has expanded a bajillion percent not a mathematical figure but you get the feeling and the the new areas that are working that are pulling in money aren't his areas so and sure. and he's just uncomfortable so i think that's like you know he starts to get really uncomfortable with the with the risk that he's seeing in the firm well and and up the road i mean the whole high yield junk bond thing you had you had Mike Milken in Beverly Hills who had taught everybody that you can collect the extra spread and, and by being diversified, you're, you're not losing it, not dissimilar to some of the structural advantages that gross you. So it actually, it played well together. Um, so in November of 13, El Arian resigns in disgust over the relationship he has with gross, kind of the irony that we talked about earlier. January of 2014, they announced it to the public finally. Um, you know, we were talking before this, uh, just so listeners know about Greg Zuckerman uh, and Kirsten Grine, who obviously reported this and, um, great, yeah, great, great writers. Um, you know, Greg did our first podcast on his book, the frackers and Kirsten originally wrote from our hometown in Seattle, um, to the outside. I mean, you talked about Morningstar and investors, but how unsettling was this episode to, to the public? Enormously unsettling. I mean, there had been this guy on TV for decades who was this self-effacing, like humble seeming folksy guy with this frail little voice and he was so smart and nice. And it turns out that internally at his firm at PIMCO, Bill Gross is not this self-effacing, humble, kind, sweet old man. You know, he was this intense, like shy, but you know, that manifested as don't make eye contact with him. 
Um, mm -hmm. extreme. I mean, the the degree, the mismatch between his public image and how things actually were at PIMCO, I think that was very disruptive. Like people were shocked. It was one of those articles that like everyone stopped what they were doing to read and everyone's like, what? Like sending it around, talking about it because of that difference and that divergence. And, and people, you know, people who had a familiarity with PIMCO were like, yeah, no, I know. But that's not that big of a, a world like the mutual fund world and the investing world is so much larger than that and people who had followed bill but didn't know were just blown away and i think mm -hmm. bill was blown away you know this this article really was the thing that started you know we've said before this was the moment this but this was really the moment where he yeah. starts to kind of unravel this this kicked off his real spiral the curtain was pulled back and there was no wizard of oz uh that brings us to the 2014 Morningstar Investment Conference. Uh, uh, teach us about what happened there. Yeah, so um, it's June 19th, 2014. I'm sitting in the back of the enormous ballroom, you know, that's filled with all these tables. I'm typing away on my little computer trying to, I just done an interview with Bill Gross about selling volatility and I was like so excited to get my story out. He takes the stage um, and he puts on like rimless sunglasses which is a bit unusual. No one else had put on sunglasses, but he's like, oh, the lights are really bright. And he's like, I look like a, you know, Justin Bieber of Bonds. And he's like talking about like, if anyone wants to get to know the, his feminine side, he starts talking about how he's like Kim Kardashian or something. He <laughs> recounts the entire plot of the Manchurian candidate and alludes to the fact that he had business cards printed with the queen of hearts on the back. It's just like next level, absolutely next level. And everyone in the audience, you know, the, the Morningstar crowd is like the warmest possible audience for a Bill Gross speech that you could get. This yeah. is where like everyone loves this guy. Everyone's running for I'm like, yeah, okay, he's having a tough year, whatever. We love him. So he's starting off and everyone's like, <laughs> all right, sunglasses, that's whatever. He's a weird guy. That's fine. But as he's talking and it gets weirder and weirder, they're just like, wait, what's going on? Like, who? What's ha is he okay? Like, is my money safe with PIMCO? And, and I think this is when the public started to really catch on. I don't know if you could have recovered from that journal article, you know, like like Bill was so like like unsettled by that personally that probably not. But like public facing images ha can recover from a bad journal sure. article from a bad, sure. you know, big Cole, article. Yeah. Cole and I were in that audience with you and I, I was just it, it was baffling and just bizarre. You or, know, or, it, or it, like ghastly. It, it, it was yeah. just like, truth you gotta is, be kidding me. Tr truth is. Truth is always stranger than fiction because fiction's got to make sense. This made no sense, right? Not, I mean, it wasn't good from any marketing or any aspect. And uh, so, yeah. So, so the so the next, I mean, and by the way, this is like a kernel of just. I, I mean, only your book has this, Mary. I love it. I can't, I can't rave about how cool this is enough. Um, Bill Gross called Jeffrey Gunlock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So how did you learn about this? Like, I got to know, because I don't think, I don't know if you said in the book how you found this detail out, but, but how'd you learn about this? Well, you know, you, you flatter me to say that it's only my book because I covered PIMCO at the time. It was kind of everywhere, uh, but okay. I can see how you would miss it in the deluge of all of the things that were everywhere at the time. <laughs> there was Especially a lot as everything's going unraveling. On. Yeah, there was a lot. Oh my God, yeah. it was enormous. Yes, it was a flood. I understand. Um, and I was like right in the middle of it. So so yes, it was um, Jen Oblon at Reuters did a, a lot on this at the time as well. So what happened was, you know, Bill realizes that PIMCO's gearing up to fire him. And he's sure. like, oh, no, you don't. I don't get fired. I quit. So he's <laughs> trying to figure out kind of a game plan of how to, you know, he wants to keep control of his narrative of his life and, and the way that he will walk out of the building. And so he calls Jeffrey Gunlock. And my favorite part is that he asks, is it Jeff or Jeffrey? And Jeffrey Gunlock is like, it's Jeffrey. And like, it's just, <laughs> I like get chills. I'm like, oh, anyway. So they have this like summit, this meeting at Jeffrey Gunlock's house where they talk about what's going on at PIMCO. You know, Bill shares what's happening and he's distraught. And he is sharing because he in part knows that Jeffrey Gunlock has been through something not dissimilar, right? At TCW where he had this fractious departure and it ended up being this kind of nasty lawsuit. But there were a lot of parallels where they're like, I'm the moneymaker, I'm the guy, and you're not respecting me enough. And so they think that I think that those parallels were very much present in this conversation. And they're trying to figure out if Jeffrey Gunlock could hire Bill Gross at Double Line, which is like very, I mean, it doesn't make sense to say out loud. Like you can hear how that would go poorly in every mm -hmm. way. But that was a real idea that these two men batted around for a minute. 
So as we all know, you know, Gross left for Janice to join his former colleague that was, you know, running Janice at the time. Um, that didn't end up working. Uh, Gross had to go through some personal issues in the meantime. But it, but he's been very philanthropic. I think you do a really good job explaining, you know, what he's done with his money and how he's tried to bless other people with with the blessing he has. Um, yeah, quite. How, how, how do you look at his legacy going forward? Um, there's no question his clout. I think your book does a great job of explaining his clout, his importance to the bond market. Um, I just wonder, you know, personally, and this is a, and I'll throw this back to you, but, you know, my question is, is he just going to be a relic of the bond market 30 years from now? In other words, are we going to say, well, he did so well, but that was a bond bull market? Or, or do you think it's going to be something different from that in a legacy perspective? Mm, that's so interesting because it is his career does kind of coincide with the trajectory of the bond market. You know, he was ascendant when it was and then he kind of wasn't when it wasn't. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. I think, you know, it's the personal life, life stuff that you um, allude to has been also damaging to that legacy. And mm -hmm. I think had he retired in 2014 instead of going to Janice and instead of having these like very high profile problems in his personal life, I would have written a very different book. I thought I was going to write that book, you know? Sure. I thought that I was going to write this, you know, great bond market legend story. And it ended up changing so much. And I think, I don't know, it's sad because he did so much in the market. He was so influential. He was so foundational and helped to create the world we live in. But the things that people talk about, I mean, I've, I've told this before, but like when I was at a dinner party a couple years ago, I was, you know, telling some friend of a friend about my book and, you know, I was like, oh, this bond market, blah, blah, you know, doing the usual kind of elevator pitch. And she's like, mm -hmm. wait, is that the guy who left um, dead fish in the air vents of his wife's house? And I was like, wow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's you, that went, you went from writing a novel to writing a soap opera. Yeah. And it's like, you know, that's not my area. I'm not used to writing about people's personal lives. So there's something weird about the last couple chapters where it's just a list. Like I'm like, I feel like I'm kind of clearly uncomfortable writing. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, and then he did this and then he did that. And then I'm like, oh, it's, it's cringe. It's uncomfortable. You know, I had to include it and I, I but I don't want to be gleeful. You know, I don't want to like, I don't, I don't, it's all painful and it's, it's painful to kind of experience, you know, I feel like when you're writing someone's story, you experience it with them. And that's true of every character in here, right? Like I tried to take on the, the worldview of Muhammad al and I tried to take on the worldview of Dan Iveson. All these people I have to try to embody to some degree, right? To get the story right. And so I'm like, exper I'm like writing about Bill's like horrible divorce and his dispute with his neighbor and just feeling that like, this isn't where he wants to be. This isn't what he wants to be happening. Like it sucks. So there's a lot of things we didn't get into. And, and by the way, just to, the things that we won't talk about today probably, but um, you know, you did a great job of talking about the regulations these folks dealt with in mutual funds. And I mean, 17A7, just the fact that you know about that and you could write about it, I think is just phenomenal. So the other parts, when you talk about that, how much they cornered markets, um, I think your story on the, the treasury futures was incredible and how they were using legalese to effectively screw the market. So I, I, I think that was phenomenal granular journalism. Um, is there anything that we haven't talked about um, that you do think needs to be said um, that, that we haven't got into? Oh, gosh. Um, I don't think so. Let me, there's one little anecdote that I just told at Morningstar that they were like, that's not in your book. And I have to confirm. Um, oh, it's really not in the book. Okay. So this, this is my favorite like little story that didn't make it in. It, it's, it's relevant to the interview question um, kind mm -hmm. of umbrella. So one employee, one, one person who worked at PIMCO for a long time, she says that when she interviewed people, she had a like a cuckoo clock in her office and it would have a little, you know, cuckoo every hour. And she says that it ended up being very convenient because when she was doing these job interviews with people who wanted a job at PIMCO, she would, you know, the little cuckoo would cuckoo. And if they jumped, she would be like, I'm sorry, it's not going to work out. This is not fit. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you just man. don't have the nerves. Like you're not gonna make it here. <laughs> I just love that story. That's one of my. I, uh, I regret that it's not in the books, but uh, but it was. Uh, it's telling. Well, I I love that, and I really appreciate you sharing that with our our podcast listeners. Um, Mary, your book is riveting. The Bond King does a great job of of teaching readers about the inner workings, of the investment business, the bond business, and the culture of a money management firm, uh, I, I think, and, and I'll, I'll say this, and I'll, you know, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll put this on your book cover at some point, this will likely be the seminal book for understanding the bond bull market that began in the early 1980s. 
Um, we very much thank you for having for, for coming on and joining us. Um, for our listeners of the podcast, if you have a great book like Mary's um, that you'd like to recommend, email podcast at smeadcap.com. That's podcast at smeadcap.com. Thank you for joining us for a Book with Legs podcast. We look forward to the next episode. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Mary. Thank you. This was really fun. Thank you for listening to A Book with Legs, a podcast brought to you by Smead Capital Management. The material provided in this podcast is for informational use only and should not be construed as investment advice. You can learn more about Smead Capital Management and its products at smeadcap.com or by calling your financial advisor.